Hi, I'm Josh. I recently started working on a game called Mansion, and you can see the devlog for that on this channel. One of the things I wanted in this game was completely customizable post-processing, and it turns out that when implementing this yourself, it's actually quite hard to find documentation, so that's what I'm going to talk about in this video. Note that when I say from scratch in the title, it means that I'm not going to be using any packages like scriptable renderer pipeline or post-processing, I'm just going to be using the good old-fashioned Unity built-in renderer. I'm going to write the example in 2D, but the exact same principle applies to 3D games too. Here I have a brand new Unity 2D project. I'll first set up a sample scene. This little dinosaur thing is going for an interview. He's also standing on a girder, I guess? Let's start with a shader that we want to use to process the screen image. Any old shader will do, because we're just going to delete everything. Here we have a very simple shader. It does no culling, it doesn't touch the Z buffer. It simply just gets the color at each position on the main text and returns it as is, without any changes. If I were to say cull.g equals zero, that means that every pixel on the screen will have its green component removed from it. So you won't see any green on the screen. I'll also note that some tutorials will say color here. You should always use sv underscore target because it means the same thing except it works on more platforms. So now I'm going to add a component to our main camera that will do the post-processing for us. I'm going to call it post camera. So now that we have this component, I'm going to simply instantiate a material based on our brand new shader in the start function. I'll also go ahead and grab the camera component. Right now there's a bit of a problem, and that's that the shader is sitting in our root folder, and nothing is actually referring to it. This string here does not count as referring to the shader. It needs to be referenced by a scene or a prefab or something. And so because there are no references, if we build our game right now, that shader will not actually be included in the build. So right now what we need to do is create a new folder and call it resources. And if you put the shader in there, it will always be included in the build. Any folder called resources will always be included in the build. So putting our shader in here makes it safe. So here's where it gets interesting. If you have a game object with a camera component, then this function will automatically be called every frame after the camera has finished rendering the scene. Your job when implementing this function yourself is to put something in the processed image. For example, this graphics blit command will basically make the function have no effect. The final rendered image goes onto the screen exactly as it came in. So the final rendered image is in the original texture, the result goes into the processed texture. If I were to play the game right now, then you'll see no change to the final rendered image. What if I were to pass an extra argument to graphics.blit? And the argument is the material for our custom shader that we made just before that turns off all the green on the screen. Aha! Now we can do whatever we want in the shader and it will add post-processing to our final image. For example, instead of setting everything to green, I could set color to one minus color and the whole image will be inverted. Now what I want to do is get this picture of a light, render it to its own layer then multiply that layer by the main layer. This is a lot like what you can do in just about any image editing program like Photoshop, GIMP, or Krita. So I have this really simple demonstration in Krita. I have one layer that is our main colors, and then I have a lighting layer with a picture of a light on it. What I can do on the lighting layer is set its layer mode to multiply the layer below it. And that way, wherever this texture is, it will multiply the layer below it. I want to replicate this in Unity. The way I'm going to achieve this is by dedicating a layer in Unity for the lighting. I can then use the camera component's culling mask property to render just the main layer or just the lights layer. If I set up the main camera's culling mask to not include the light layer, then we already have the main layer in its own texture in the onRenderImage function. 
What we can do is manually tell a camera component to render to any render texture we want just before we do graphics.blit and that way we will always have an up-to-date image of that camera. I have this little demonstration that I made in Blender. We have these two cameras. This one will be the main camera and this one I'll call the pass camera. So just after this camera has finished rendering over here, and just before we do the graphics.blit call in on render image, what we want to do is reposition the pass camera exactly where the main camera is and tell the pass camera to render to another texture with a different culling mask. So we can use that image in the post-processing shader to apply lighting. There is in fact a function in Unity that does that for you. It's called camera.copyfrom. First, I'll make a new layer called Lighting. And move the light image to that new layer. What we need now is that second camera that we can render from. For this, I'll just add another camera as a child to our main camera. You must remember to remove the audio listener component from this new camera because you can only have one in a scene. I'll also disable the camera component so it doesn't get confused as the main camera. It also doesn't need to be enabled for us to be able to render the scene manually. In the post camera script, I'll add pass camera as a public property and set it in the editor. In the on render image function, I will tell the pass camera to copy from the main camera. We then need to tell it to render to a texture that we can access after the rendering has finished. The simplest way to do that is to use the rendertexture.getTemporary function and pass in original.descriptor and that will get us a texture that has identical dimensions and properties to the original texture. I'll call this light texture. You mustn't forget that when using get temporary, you need to call render texture.release temporary. If you don't do this, you're gonna have a bad day because you'll run out of RAM and your computer will die. Totally not spoken from experience. We then need to tell the pass camera that it should render to this new texture that we got. You'll also need to set the target texture back to null before you release temporary, because otherwise you'll get lots of errors due to the texture still being used. And finally, we can actually tell the pass camera to render. When the render is finished, the contents of light texture will be the final rendered image from pass camera. Now, if instead of blitting the original texture to the processed texture, I were to use the light texture as the input, you should expect the resulting image to remain exactly the same, because all we've done is cloned the main camera and told the clone to render instead. So if I play the game in Unity right now, you'll see that nothing has changed at all, except now it's a little bit less efficient than it used to be. So let's just revert that change for now. You'll note that the image from the main camera still includes the light image. So to fix that, in the editor, I can set the main camera's culling mask to not include the lighting layer. Now what I want is for the pass camera to draw just the lighting layer. So let's try just setting the culling mask on the pass camera accordingly. And then play the game. Notice that did not work at all. The problem here is that copy from also copies the culling mask, which is not surprising. So this will have to be done in the post camera class. We want just the lighting layer by itself, so Just after doing the copy from, I reset the culling mask to only include the light layer. And now you'll see in the editor that on the whole screen there is just the light by itself. This blue right here is going to interfere with the lighting, so I'll set it to black. And what you can see now is a nice full screen image of just the lighting of our scene. What I'll need now is to somehow combine the main camera's original texture with our lighting texture. Here's where we get back to that shader that I made just before. You'll note that in the final path shader, in the properties section, there is a single input called main text. This particular property with its exact name is required by graphics.blit. So when you tell it to blit the original onto the processed image, 
the blit function will set the main text property of our material to the original texture. This is why we don't need to do that ourselves. Since main text represents the main camera's render result, you may have already figured out that all we have to do to add the light texture input is to add a second property to the shader. We'll call it lighting text. And every property must have an equivalent global variable in the program code down here. To apply the lighting to the main texture, all I need to do is multiply the pixels that share the same position on the screen. We also need to manually set the lighting text value on the material in our c -sharp code. You can think of a material as the current state of a shader's properties. So since we have underscore main text and underscore lighting text as our input properties to our shader, the material will represent the current values of those properties. Let's go ahead and cache that name so we don't have to look it up every time on render image is called. I'll just quickly change this blit function to blit the original texture again. And there you go, we just wrote code to render two layers from the same perspective and do some custom compositing with them. Now for a lighting system, you will probably want it to work even when you aren't playing the game. We can get that working in the game view pretty easily. Just add the execute always attribute to the top of your component and it will always do the on render image even when you aren't playing the game. But you can see that in the scene view, it looks super ugly and also the light button does nothing at all. The first thing we'll do is add the image effect allowed in scene view attribute to our post camera class. What this does is if the post camera component is enabled on the active camera, then the scene view's internal camera will magically gain an instance of the post camera component too. You can see that something is definitely happening now, but it's certainly not what we want. If I move the view around quickly, then you will see a weird looking trail. This is because the scene view camera doesn't clear the buffer between frames. And also the scene view's camera has all the layers enabled in its culling mask, unlike our main camera over here. Here's where it gets a little tricky. I found that handling modifications to the internal scene view camera requires some finesse to not run into all sorts of errors and things randomly ceasing to work. What I'm going to do is automatically install a child camera onto the main camera and that way the scene view will automatically gain one too. This has other advantages such as not having to deal with the pass camera manually each time that you use our custom post camera component. I'm just going to delete the pass camera for now. I'll then make the pass camera property private and in the start function, I will automatically set up a child camera object. If the pass camera property is not set, then I want to first look to see if there is already a child called pass camera. This will avoid problems when you change some C sharp code and Unity reloads the scripts, possibly breaking the references while leaving an existing pass camera child. If the object already exists, then I'll make sure it has a camera component. If the object does not exist, then add it. This is where I find that the scene view will go totally nuts and stuff will break all the time. The secret source to fixing this problem is to use something from editor utility, which will require an extra import and a bit of editor specific code. Here I've used hide flags dot hide and don't save, which means that the pass camera won't even appear in the editor tree view, won't be saved to scene or prefab files, and also won't cause prefab overrides when its properties change. Don't forget to disable the camera component too. Now it should look like nothing has changed, except somehow it's actually working even though we can't see our pass camera in the tree view over here. Something else to note is that the culling mask on the scene view camera is also used for selection. So when you turn on and off items in this menu up here, it changes the culling mask in the scene view. This means that we don't want to change that culling mask in our code since it will break selection in the scene view. 
The solution I've found is to use the pass camera to render the main camera stuff to its own separate texture and completely discard the results of the same view camera's render in the onRenderImage function. To avoid rendering twice in a real build of the game, we can just use hash if unity editor and define a more efficient rendering method for the final build than in the editor. I'll leave that optimization as an exercise for the viewer. For now, I'll just render two extra passes instead of just one. We'll want to create another temporary texture and do all this rendering stuff twice. So I'll move all this into a function that lets me render any set of layers to an image. And then render everything but the lighting layer to its own texture. The tilde here inverts the mask selection, so it'll include everything but the lighting layer. And of course, don't forget to release the main texture either. And instead of blitting the original texture, I'll blit this new main texture. And also up in this render pass function, I'll add a new line to tell the pass camera to always clear the color, so you don't end up with that weird trail. And voila, it works in the scene view. How cool is that? You may notice another problem here, and that's that the light button is actually disabled, and when I click it, well, nothing happens. That's to be expected because we didn't write any code to make something happen. So back in the start function, what I'll do is add a bit of code that checks to see if the camera's type indicates that it's actually a scene view camera, and then locate and cache the associated scene view instance. This will now allow me to check if the scene lighting button is set to on. And now if the scene lighting is turned off, it simply just renders the original scene view camera directly without modification. You can, unfortunately, see the light image here, but you can just turn off the lighting layer in the layer dropdown. So now you can just add the post camera component to any camera that you like, and it will just magically work. There are of course a lot of extra optimizations and extra features that I could add to this, and have in fact added to a similar component from the game that I'm working on, but I won't be covering that in this tutorial as it's just details. There are also other approaches to achieving the same results in Unity, but hey, this one works pretty well. And that concludes this tutorial. Thank you very much for watching up to this point. As I mentioned a couple of times, I'm working on a game called Mansion, and I'll be posting devlog videos and more tutorials on this channel. So please, subscribe if you want to see more, and like this video if you want to make me feel good.